good afternoon, good evening to our friends in Australia, Asia, Europe, Canada, the United States, and elsewhere in the world. My name is Ellis Martin. Welcome to Minds and Money Online Connect. We are going to have a pitch bottle, a pitch battle featuring five amazing mining companies to a panel of investor judges. Each mining company will have three minutes to state their case, make their pitch, and ultimately convince investors why they should risk $1 million of their money by investing it with their company. Today, we're going to be covering a variety of metals and opportunities, ranging from gold, silver, copper, zinc, graphite, and so much more. Keep in mind, management, project, economic viability, share and or capital structure, jurisdiction, and markets are all very important factors in selecting the right opportunity. The most important component of any public or private entity for that matter is the skill set of the CEO as a presenter. At the end of the day, it's a pitch. In this business, we're all salespeople. So talk to us, inform us, charm us, convince us. After each three minute presentation, we are allowing seven minutes for the panel of investors to question each CEO. As we've seen in the past, I expect these questions to be as direct as possible. Pull no punches, let your skepticism and or optimism fly. After all the, after all the presenters have pitched and have been grilled by the panelists, we will ask the investor panelists to make their choice and cast their vote for $1 million. There's a tie, and I certainly hope that there isn't. I will be the tie-breaking casting vote. Our presenting companies are as follows. Northern Graphite will be presented by Greg Bose, the Chief Executive Officer. Michael Bennett, the Chief Executive Officer of Alta Mira Gold will be next. Then we will hear from Max Porterfield, President and Chief Executive Officer of Kalanex Mines. Paul Gill is the CEO and director of Pompa Metals. And finally, James Anderson, the chairman and chief executive officer of G Silver will present. Our judges are as follows. John Forwood, the chief investment officer of Lowell Resources Funds Management. Keith Spence, the CEO of Global Mining Capital. James Morrison is the managing director of Gresham Resources Royalties Fund. From down under, Gerard Farley, the executive chairman of Empire Securities Group and Daniel Porter, portfolio manager resources pure asset management. Let us begin with Greg Bose, the Chief Executive Officer of Northern Graphite. You have three minutes, sir. Hello, everyone. Uh, for those of you that are not uh, familiar with Graphite, it is the largest component in a lithium ion battery. It requires the largest production increase of any battery mineral, and most of it comes from China. It hasn't got as much attention as the other battery minerals because it had a dramatic price spike and that's because of excess production capacity in China. But battery demand is growing at over 20% a year, and that price spike is coming, uh, and we are about to experience what the other minerals have already experienced, and graphite valuations for the most part are still uh, very reasonable. How do you invest in graphite? There are 20 or 25 advanced stage companies around the world. Not all have quality battery grade graphite, not all are in good jurisdictions and graphite is a somewhat opaque and transparent industry so it's difficult to for investors to sort that out we at northern graphite think we have made that process simple for you we have a high quality advanced stage project here in canada but the game changing transaction is within the next one to two weeks we are going to close the acquisition of the natural graphite division of Emirates sa a 5 billion euro company based in Paris. That transaction will make us the only North American graphite producer and the third largest non-Chinese graphite producer. In addition to that, we have two very large development projects in the pipeline behind that that can take our production capacity from approximately 50,000 tons a year up to 300,000 tons a year. All of those projects are located close to infrastructure in politically stable countries, and they have proven high quality graphite that is suitable uh, for the battery market. That transaction is being financed by the Sprott Group. It's about a $65 million US uh, uh, transaction in total. So while a lot of graphite companies are out there talking about uh, the battery markets, they're a couple hundred million dollars or three years away from production. 
uh, will be in production within a couple of weeks. And as I said, by the end of this year, we'll be about the third largest non-Chinese graphite uh, producer. So that in a nutshell is it. And we have a very good uh, valuation. We're based here in Canada. Projects are in Quebec and in Namibia, which is probably the best uh, jurisdiction to operate in in Africa. Thank you very much, Greg. Very timely. Appreciate your presentation. Now we're going to go straight to the judges. Let us begin with John Forwood, Chief Investment Officer of Lowell Resources. John. Thanks, Alice. Great uh, snapshot there on Northern, Northern Graphite. Uh, I've two questions, if I may. One is just a little bit of color around the um, why the excess production in China is um, forecast to uh, um, disappear. And the other one is the mine life on your acquisition of, of Imrus. Uh, yes, firstly, on the Chinese side, most of that excess production is the big uh, min metals mine in Liu Bei, Heilongjiang province. Uh, it's getting close to uh, maximum production capacity. Uh, when graphite demand was uh, 50,000 tons a year, 20% growth didn't mean that much. It's now 500,000 tons a year. 20% growth is 100,000 tons, which is a very large, one very large graphite mine we need to add every year. And basically none are under construction right now. So that 500,000 ton is already half of world demand of about a million tons a year. <coughs> Excuse me, and it's growing at over 20% per year. Uh, the, the Namibian operation has a very, very, excuse me, a very long mine life. The uh, Quebec mine has a short mine life. The reason we bought it is that uh, it gives us market customers visibility into the market, a mill and a permitted tailings pond. And we have already uh, done a deal to acquire a property to extend the life of that mine. So we expect it's going to be 10 or 15 years mine life. Thank you very much. Next, Keith Spence, CEO of Global Mining Capital. Your question, sir. Oh, uh, Greg, uh, you said you, you're, you're getting 65 million from Sprott. Is that for this, this, this size of the CapEx? Is, is the CapEx just 65 million? Uh, no, most of that is the acquisition cost from Imerus. There is um, uh, 10 or 12 million in CapEx in there. The Namibia mine is currently on care and maintenance. It'll cost that much to bring it back online within nine to 12 months. But most of that uh, fundraise, which is uh, a combination of equity, debt, a stream, and a royalty, um, most of the acquisition cost from Imerus because the, the mine in Quebec is fully operational and producing now, and the one in Namibia will be within 12 months. Yes, and, and would, would that 65 million be sufficient for the one in Namibia? Yes. Very good, and let's move on. I, I'm sorry, just we've one, gotta move on. Okay, all right. We've gotta move on, sorry. Uh, James Morrison, the Managing Director of Gresham Resources, please, your question, sir. Yeah, two questions. What are the terms of the stream with Sprott? Uh, and secondly, tell, can you talk to us about the marketing, the offtake uh, for the graphite, please, and how you've got certification for that? Uh, yes. Um, firstly, on the stream side, it's a 9% uh, of production, basically. And uh, they are paying uh, $20 million US for that, and they are getting 6 million, five, sorry, 5 million warrants. Uh, that's the stream side. On the offtake side, traditionally, there are no offtakes in the graphite business. There are long-term relationships. There are lots of companies announcing offtakes. How real they are is another question. Uh, with respect to the uh, Quebec operation, Lactazeal, uh, that mine has an existing customer base. It is selling, it has been in production for 20 years and is a demonstrated producer of high quality graphite. And again, that's the way the graphite market operates is that uh, most of that is done on <coughs> purchase orders and relationships, not long-term offtakes. The offtake thing is, has come along because of the battery market, but of course, nobody in the West is uh, producing uh, graphite or anode material. 
So an offtake agreement really doesn't mean that much right now. All right, fantastic. Let's move on to uh, Gerard Farley, the executive chairman of the Empire Sur Securities Group. Yes, uh, Gregory, I'm fascinated with your uh, pricing power and what percentage of sales at spot uh, at the spot price, and 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 are you going to forward? Are you going to make some forward sale agreement? Uh, uh, there really, it, yeah, uh, there really is no spot or forward market in the graphite business. It's similar to a number of other industrial minerals. So we have a let's say a customer who's a long-term customer. We establish the price for the year and uh, an idea of deliveries and those deliveries and prices can be adjusted during the course of the year depending on what's happening in the market but the price is not nearly as volatile as uh, base or precious metals and what sort of margin are you getting at the moment and what margin are you predicting uh, the margin is around 50 percent and uh, that's what we are predicting it will continue at all right, we've got one more final question from Daniel Porter. Thanks, Ellis. Uh, great presentation. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about your cost base versus those uh, uh, Chinese uh, competitors and, and where you're sitting on that cost curve? Uh, and then when do you think you'll be at, um, at break-even profitability as well, please? Um, to answer your second question, first, we expect to be profitable out of the gate. The Lactazeal mine we're buying in Quebec is profitable now. Um, because we have an operating mine in um, Quebec and we have a mine in Africa that was operating, we have very good transparency on pricing. And uh, I can tell you that most of the feasibility studies out there are on the optimistic side, if I can put it that way. So, you know, our costs are going to be. Uh, in the seven to eight hundred dollars a ton range, and the price is in the fifteen hundred dollar a ton range. Uh, people that are forecasting costs of three or four hundred dollars a ton, uh, I doubt it. The Chinese Fantastic. are higher. Than, the Chinese are higher than that. Fantastic! Great presentation, Greg. Thank you very much. Well done. Next, we're going to move on to. Our second company that's presenting today, Altamira Gold and Chief Executive Officer, Michael Bennett. Michael. All right, we are having a little, are you ready, sir? We're, we're having trouble hearing you. So uh, what I'm gonna suggest if we don't straighten this out in a in within a few seconds is that we'll just uh, we'll have you work on that while we move on to the next uh, company. So let's try again. Can we hear you, Michael? All right, let's uh, let's have you work on that, Michael, and we'll get we'll circle back to you. If Mr. Porterfield's ready, Max Porterfield, President, Chief Executive Officer of Calinex Mines, we'd love to hear you speak right now. I'm here and I'm ready. Okay, great. It's all yours. Hi, I'm Max Porterfield, President and CEO of Calinex Mines. We trade on the OTCQX in the United States under the ticker CLLXF on the Toronto Venture under the ticker CNX. We are a base in precious metals uh, explorer with a focus in the Flin Flon Mining District of Manitoba, where we have a very, very high grade discovery that we've made in late 2020 called the Rainbow Deposit. As it sits, Flin Flon's got a 100 year production history that sits right here in the town of Flin Flon. And this is just a geologic map there where the Felsic rocks, so the host rocked 100 million tons of ore being, have ever been mined in, in the camp's history that spanned 32 mines in, I like to say, county, because we believe that Rainbow is well on the way to be the next producer there as we continue to expand the discovery. The 777 mine in the town of Flin Flon is due to shut down next month. That is 785 direct jobs being lost for a community of 5,500 people. Pine Bay is located 16 kilometers away as the crow flies from the town of Flin Flon, has direct road access, and actually the discovery sits within a mineral lease uh, and also within 200 meters of a hydroelectric power line. 
We made the discovery in late 2020 using a mix of IP chargeability ISO shells from a geophysical standpoint, coincident with borehole EM. The discovery of rainbow at depth at 900 meters vertical depth matches the discovery of the past producers in the belt at 777, as well as the wall are both discovered at depth. Over the past year, we've drilled over 35,000 meters at rainbow and have delineated the discovery up to 100 meters vertical depth. And our most recent uh, intercept at depth, which is 250 meters along strike to the north of Discovery Hole PBM 111, indicated both from the geology, geochemistry, and borehole EM, the rainbow is going to continue at depth, which is indicative of these VMS systems uh, that grow in flint flon. Rainbow, as it sits to date, was pre resourced. Again, the discovery was made August 2022. Uh, in terms of grades, it's standing up to be one of the highest grade copper discoveries not just in North America, but truly on a global basis, which is indicative of, of what makes Flint Lawn so unique. So to date in the orange zone, which is the most pronounced lens that we've drilled out today, it goes from the 100, and the 100 meters below surface down to the 900 meter level from drilling so far, you're averaging roughly 4% copper equivalent, and that's gonna be 90% copper, the rest will be a mix of gold, silver, and zinc as byproducts to that. And within the deposit, we're also hitting some very significantly wide intervals within Rainbow, uh, one of the headline holes here, this is 33 meters true width of 6.28% copper. So again, in, the, uh, in, in terms of what Rainbow is shaping up to be, is we're looking to become one of the highest grade, cleanest copper mines in the world uh, as we delineate the resource later this year and publish a Maiden, maiden 43101 compliant resource on Rainbow uh, later this year, as well as an updated resource on the adjacent Pine Bay deposit which is 1.1 million tons historic at 2.75% copper. In addition, we're going to be testing regional I've got to targets. interrupt you here. I'm terribly sorry. I have to interrupt you, Matt. That's fine. To do it. That's your time. You'll have a chance to answer the questions, perhaps fit everything else in during the, uh, during the next portion of our, our program here. I'm going to ask the judges right now, Daniel Porter, please ask away. We're looking forward to your response to your question. Thanks, Ellis. Uh, good presentation, Max. Looks really exciting. Some of those grades are amazing. Um, can you talk about your exploration plans over the next 12 months and how you're funding those? Uh, and then uh, when you expect to uh, expect to um, put some more meat around those uh, drill results as well? So in terms of our exploration plans and how we're going to fund them, we've just recently, uh, in the midst of completing a, a financing here, uh, we're going to be oversubscribed on that financing uh, to, to complete that, that drilling. In terms of meters, we're planning on drilling phase one of 25,000 meters uh, of drilling. Uh, some of that will be allocated to doing infill drilling at Rainbow, which will lead up to a, publishing a maiden resource on Rainbow within the first 900 meters at the surface, as well as an updated resource on the Pine Bay deposit, which sits about 600 meters away from Rainbow, historic. In addition to that, we're going to be using some of that meter to test five different key target areas across the property. Uh, where we really expand the exploration tool set that was uh, used on a smaller portion of our land package that led to the discovery of Rainbow. Fantastic. Thanks. Next, we have a question from Gerard Farley, please. Yes, uh, what's, uh, what, do you, what do you think, what uh, production rate were you hoping or planning on and when do you think you could commence production, assuming you your infill drilling uh, lives up to the to the to the current bandwidth, if you like. Right. In terms of uh, a maiden resource on Rainbow and Pine Bay, I think we collectively like to go, and uh, you know, roughly five million tons within the first nine hundred meters of surface. And I think your initial production rate and an operation and the deposit that size would be roughly fifteen hundred tons per day, giving you a ten-year mine life. All right. Our next question will come from James Morrison. Yeah, hi. Do you consider yourself explorers or, 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 or developers of mines? Uh, well, we're explorers is our technical skill set. Our technical team has been credited with the discovery of three of the four largest mines in the Flint Pond District's history. The only mine that was larger that they weren't credited with the discovery of was the original Flint Pond ore body, uh, but none of them would have been, uh, I couldn't find that person because that was discovered quite a long time ago. Uh, so no, it's explorers by uh, experience and and, uh, and obviously we'll bring in this skill set moving forward as we advance the properties. 
All right, let's proceed with Keith Spence, CEO of Global Mining Capital. Keith. Hi there, Max. Uh, really good uh, presentation, excellent presentation. Um, what's the, the general geology? Is it very similar to uh, the Flint Pond uh, deposits? Uh, uh, it, it seems to me, me that this is a copper based deposit. Yeah, so they're all VMS, similar to Flint Pond in terms of age of the rocks, they're younger. Uh, the, the Pine Bay area is an actually analogous to the Chisel Lake Basin, which is in the Snow Lake area, the Flint Pond Greenstone Belt, which hosted the Lawler Mine. Uh, but it is typical VMS. The difference here in terms of the deposits uh, in Flint Fawn is all the deposits at Pine Bay are, are near vertically uh, uh, plunging and dip about 82 degrees. Whereas if you look at the 777 and Callan deposits, those dip at a 55 degrees. So I think there's a real opportunity uh, for them to be much cleaner just because you get much less mine dilution with the way they sit underground. But same right. both. Keith, we'll allow you one more question. Uh, uh, what about the local community? You, you have any issues with uh, indigenous people around that uh, for a potential mine? No, we've got a great amount of community support. I mean, the, the town of Flint Falls has been mining for 100 continuous years. And um, that's what we're looking to achieve is extending that, uh, that community's rich history. Our technical team's done it twice before with the discovery of Trout Lake by our former chairman, uh, and founder Mike Mozlowski that went into production in 1982 when the original Flint Flon ore body was shutting down. And then later again by our one of our technical team members, Jim Pickell, who won the Bill Dennis Award for the 777 mine that went into production in 2004 as Trout Lake unwinded. So we're collectively doing it again and we've got the whole community behind us because again, that's 785 direct jobs for a community that's just 5,500 people. And our Thanks. final question, Thank you very much, Keith. And our final question will go to John Forwood. Oh, look, great discovery. That's um, that's remarkable. Just a question: um, Has it been mined at surface in, historically, and and what's the size and shape of the zone that you've got at the moment in terms of width and strike length? Uh, so, in terms of historic mining, this uh, the, all the mines in Flint Flon area are historically underground, with the exception of the original Flint Flon ore body that was open pit and then went underground. In terms of mining at Rainbow, Rainbow is a brand new discovery. The discovery hole again was August, 2020, and every hole we put into it is, is brand new. So we're, we're delineating the deposit uh, uh, as we speak and have been doing that since the discovery hole. And what was the back half of that question? Uh, just the size and shape of the, the, the zone you've got at the moment. Right, so the, uh, the orange zone, which is the most prolific zone that we've drilled into has a strike of 150 meters. Uh, and it's plunging from the 100 meter level down at least to the 900 meter level. Uh, and that is really fits the kind of the mold which you look for in Flint Flon. For every one meter strike in, in Flint Flon, they're elongated. You're looking between a, a plunge extent of five to eight times that for each lens that you have. In terms of true width for lenses in Flint Flon, you're looking between three to eight meters for these lenses. And the orange zone, for example, uh, is eight meters. So it's on the wider end of that air, area. Uh, and there is some blowout areas, like I mentioned, showed. We're hitting, we're hitting true widths of uh, over 30 meters of that high grade. All right. Well, thank you very much. You did an excellent job of presenting, Max. Thank you. Kudos, kudos to you. Thank you. Our, our next presenting company, we'll circle back to Mike Bennett. I understand he's ready with Altamira Gold. Mike, it's all yours. Thank you. Hey, guys. I'm share screen with you. So... I'm presenting Altamira Gold. Uh, we're a company uh, based in uh, northern Mato Grosso in Brazil. We have three major projects, Cajueiro, uh, Apiacaz, and Santa Elena. We started off as a gold company in 2016. And with the discovery of the first porphyry copper in the Alta Fresta belt by Anglo-American in 2017, we've changed our focus slightly to copper. So if we start with Cajueiro, Cajueiro is, has a 700,000 ounce resource. It has a big upside. We're about to start trenching and drilling. What a very, very strong soil anomaly called Maria Bonita. And we'll do that in the second half this year. And our aim is to double the resource in the next 12 months. We have a permit to start an early stage mining operation on this Cajueiro property. 
which will give us the capacity to produce 200,000 tonnes of material a year and give the company a production of between 12 and 15,000 ounces a year at a cost of $600. Uh, the, uh, the project, which is the gold copper project, is 60 kilometres to the southwest of the Anglo-American Fund. We've just started drilling uh, in November there, and I can't show you these pictures, but I can tell you it's a, an unbelievably red core. It's the hematitic, hematitic uh, alteration, which shows that we're in a, a porphyry, alka, probably alkaline porphyry uh, environment. And we are in the very early stages of uh, our drilling there. We've drilled two and a half thousand meters so far. And we will be carrying out our own drone mag survey on that area in the next uh, in the next two months, and that will give us the uh, the orientation to in the second half of this year carry out deeper drilling and look for the porphyritic intrusive centre. And these uh, in alkaline intrusives usually are quite pencil-like and thin, up to about 150 meters wide. And that's what we're looking in our 10 by 10 kilometer uh, claim block there. Uh, we also have very high grade gold in the veins which are emanating from the center of this, this project. This uh, porphyry is 1.7 billion years old. So we are aware that it will probably be chopped up. It may well be moved. And so we're using uh, world class consultants to orientate us in the exploration. And we will be obviously uh, looking to, in the near future, uh, talk to major copper companies with the idea of uh, perhaps considering it in the future a JV for this property. We have one other property which is called Apia Kaz. It's a district, it's 50 kilometers in east-west extent. It's produced one and a half million ounces of gold historically by the uh, artisanal miners. And we have uh, identified 10 different kilometer uh, sized uh, targets on there, which will be trenched and will be drill rated for the second half of 2022. And that's your time, Michael. Thank you very much. Great job, great Thank presentation, you. appreciate it. Let's begin with our judges. <clears throat> We're starting this time with John Forwood with Lowell Resource Funds Management. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I didn't catch all of uh, the int intro in terms of uh, you're looking to move into production, but uh, could you tell us what the capital might be to, to do that and, and, and just reiterate what the, what the uh, ounces per annum might be? Yeah, the way it works in uh, Brazil, John, is you can take out box sampling licenses. So we in our resource area where we have 700,000 ounces, I've seen the opportunity to produce on the box sites which go down to 20 meters. And what we'll do there is uh, to use the four bulk sampling licenses we've got there to produce 200,000 tons a year, and obviously open up small open pits. The cost is very low, $600 an ounce, because we've got basically no stripping ratio in this area. And the plant cost will be uh, around about 6 million US. Thank you. I'm on mute. I was on mute. I was I was on mute. I apologize. Uh, Keith Spence, are you ready, sir, with your question? Yeah. Yes, uh, Michael. Interesting presentation. Uh, what's your focus? Are you going to be a, a gold company or a copper company? Well, the focus is, uh, is and still was and is still a gold company, but because we, um, when we started seeing copper on surface and seeing that the fact that porphyries were being discovered in this, uh, this belt, I mean, you know, 43 years ago, it was all jungle, so no real modern day exploration has been done in this area. And so we saw the opportunity here as a very small junior to actually start opening the Pandora's box and proving that we were sitting on top of the porphyry. Um, the focus, if we uh, hit the, um, the center of the porphyry intrusive, will change from gold to copper without a shadow of a doubt. And there are several major companies in the belt 
looking for copper and looking for other porphyries there. So I think we, uh, depending how, how things go in the next six months in the expiration, I think we'll probably have uh, quite a few calls uh, coming down the line for to see what's going on in that project. And, and Michael, uh, with respect to your uh, copper pro sorry, your uh, gold projects, do you have a resource? Yeah, we have a, a 43101 resource, 700,000 ounces on Cajuera. And we have three golden soil anomalies within the same plane block, which extend for more than five kilometers in strike length. One of which, Maria Bonita, will, will be drilling and trenching this year. And I believe that's got the capacity to double our resources in that area. Thanks, Michael. Great. Thank you very much. James Morrison, Gresham Resource Royalty Fund. Please, your question, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, look, what's the operating environment like in this in, in this part of Brazil? Uh, you, you, you've mentioned that you've got some very sizable neighbours nearby, but I um, probably would benefit from an update. Okay, well, Mato Grosso is the state with the largest GDP in the whole of Brazil, largely fueled by agriculture. So all around us, there are huge uh, tracts of soya, maize, sunflower, cotton, um, it was an area which 43 years ago was all jungle. And very limited year span. It's changed enormously. It's got fantastic road systems. The Cajuera project that we are sitting uh, on, which is one and a half hours drive away from where I am right now in North Foresta, um, has a hydroelectric scheme and a hydroelectric power line running right through our project. Um, the main problem I would say in Brazil is not the mining licenses, it's the environmental license. And that does take a few months to move along the, the way, but uh, everything's very, very well laid out. Everything's now online. And uh, I think we can honestly say that a better exploration place to work in doesn't exist on the planet than the north of Mato Grosso. Fantastic, great questions. Gerard Farley, looking forward to your question, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what your, uh, but what's your capital position at the moment? We've got 5.4 million in the bank. We raised 4 million uh, last February, uh, and we've uh, exercised quite a few warrants during the last 12 months. So we've got plenty of cash there to uh, sustain our drilling program for the next 18 to 24 months. So when would the next resource update be? Um, well, I think the next resource update, uh, uh, Keith, will probably be after we've drilled two, trenched and drilled two of these uh, uh, soil anomalies, starting with Maria Bonita and then hopefully moving on to another one to the, to the west of that. I think that will be in about uh, nine months' time. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Our final question is from Daniel Porter with Pure Asset Management. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mike. It's all looking pretty pretty exciting over there. And just talk about the operating environment on the ground. Obviously, uh, Brazil's been pretty heavily impacted uh, on the COVID front over the past two years. Any lingering impacts from that, uh, particularly around getting assays and things like that done, drill rigs out to site, actually finding drillers to, to do the work for you? Yeah, COVID it has no impact at all at the moment. Um, labs are taking between four and six weeks to, to get assays back, but drilling is a problem. So actually finding a, a decent drilling company which uh, produces core at a reasonable rate for an exploration company and with a good recovery is not easy. We've been lucky to, to find one of those companies and we're, we're hanging on to that rig for dear life. You know, we're not going to let it go and we're moving it from project to project. So during 2023, we will be drilling in all three of our main projects. Fantastic, great presentation, Michael. Great questions from the judges. I appreciate your time today, well spent. Next, let's move on and speak with Pompa Metals CEO and director, Paul Gill. Paul, it's all yours. Thanks, Ellis, and thanks everyone for attending. I'm Paul Gill. I'm CEO of Pampa Metals. Um, trades on the TS or the uh, CSE under the symbol uh, PM, and on the OTCQB under the symbol PMMCF. We're actually doing a financing right now, so let's uh, keep that in mind as you're moving forward. 
Um, the one thing about Pampa that's very interesting is that uh, it's located in Chile, in one of the best jurisdictions, uh, mining jurisdictions of the world that has produced 30% um, of the copper in the last 50 years, and will probably continue to produce 30% uh, of the copper on an ongoing basis. Uh, there's more, dis more discoveries to be made in Chile. Um, some of the biggest mines, Escondida, et cetera, are located there. What we've done with Pampa is put together a very compelling property package of eight 100% owned projects um, that are, um, um, that are uh, managed by a, uh, a fantastic management team that are comprised of ex Rio Tinto, ex BHP, ex Anglo American. Uh, geologist and uh, corporate development people. And the linkages between uh, our company and, and uh, majors are, are very strong. We'd be able to, uh, once the discovery is made, uh, get that uh, uh, to production. Copper is the story of the day. And in fact, the story of uh, perhaps uh, the next uh, century here. We need copper, we need development uh, um, of mines and the location to look for mines is where they've already been found. As you can see from uh, our particular area of interest around Antofagasto, um, we have eight projects that are currently uh, under active exploration. Um, we have uh, that particular location, uh, the D'Amico belt and the Placine belt um, are, are a location uh, that produces most of that copper I mentioned. Um, our particular interest right now is drilling uh, our two uh, discoveries at uh, Cerro Buenos Aires, three discoveries at um, Redondo Veronica, and um, uh, a discovery that's just made on the Block 4 project. These are all pro-free deposit, uh, pro-free sort of exploration targets. And uh, that's a, a very exciting large scale um, target to look at. We're looking at, um, you know, uh, getting some uh, return on investment. We are a very small new company that's uh, at 47 million um, in shares and uh, trading at under uh, 20 million market cap. If you're investing a million dollars, you want to invest in a company like this because it will give you the best return on investment. No one here is investing to make 20% interest, you're, make, you're investing to make a, a high return on investment. And uh, we think Pampa is the opportunity to do that uh, with uh, drilling going on right now on one joint venture and uh, additional drilling to start on our block four discovery. And we'll continue to, like uh, Mike said, to hang on to that drill and, and keep it turning uh, throughout the next few months and hopefully uh, throughout the year. That's your Thank time, you very much. Thank you very much. Great job. Appreciate it, sir. And finally, we will hear from James Anderson, who's the chairman and chief executive officer of G Silver. It's all yours, sir. Ellis, just uh, Ellis, do I not get questions? Oh, I'm sorry. My my apologies. The end of the day here in California, I will use that excuse. Absolutely, you'll get questions, and I will allow you a little extra time for the uh, for the. Uh, for your trouble. Let's begin with John Forwood, Chief Investment Officer of Lowell Re Resources. For the Thanks, question Paul. for Paul. Um, sure, perhaps just quickly, you could um, give us an idea of your lead project and, and what sort of results you've, you've had so far. Yeah, uh, on the block four, what, uh, what we've had is uh, initial IP and magnetic uh, um, uh, testing done. Um, what uh, secondly has been done is a trenching of, uh, of the location, which produced stockwork veins. Uh, so that's uh, the extent of the exploration thus far. It's, uh, it's identified, uh, um, you know, uh, by IP and magnetics. So we're really excited about getting uh, drilling in there, but it's early stage in that regard. But uh, I think that uh, that's uh, the initial process was to uh, make the the discoveries and vector into where the profries are located on the on these very vast projects. There's 62,000 hectares over eight projects. Keith Spence, CEO uh, of Global Mining Capital. It's all yours, sir. Yes, uh, Paul. Just two quick questions. Uh, the first one: you seem to be uh, 
what I would call a project uh, generator model. Uh, any intentions to be really uh, focused on exploring and developing uh, a particular project? Uh, you have quite a few projects there. And then the second question, what's the situation in Chile with the new uh, leftist government and how that would affect your future? Yeah, uh, good questions. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't think we'll be a developer. Um, we do have the development team in place. Uh, Julian Bavin, uh, Tim Beal, and Adrian Manger are all uh, very experienced in, in development. And Adrian was a CFO of, uh, of BHP when he developed the Spence mine. Uh, but uh, uh, we don't want to do that. We want to explore and then join venture and uh, retain a, a, a significant interest in, in the projects going forward. In regards to the politics in Chile, um, I think it's been really overblown. We've had um, you know, the same type of governments in the past. This might be a little bit more left, but what I've seen is that they've moved towards the center. They've, um, they've cast off a little bit of the uh, communist uh, uh, trappings that were there before in order to, to really form a centrist government again, although left-leaning. So I don't think it's a, it's a big issue at this point in time. I mean, this is a location that produces a lot of, uh, of the world's copper. Uh, we need them, they need us. Uh, and I think that um, recently BHP put $100 million after the election into filo mining uh, in that location of Chile. So we don't think there's any problem in the, in the there's not gonna be any capital strike. Thanks. And I would add, I would add that uh... Paul has a great deal of experience in Latin America for many years. James Morrison, your question, please. Hi, Paul. Um, thanks for that. Uh, how much money have you spent to date, and uh, and and where is your team based? The second question. Yeah, Julian Bavin's based in Chile. Mario Orego, who's the uh, chief geologist for uh, Pampa, is also based in Chile as a team of uh, exploration um, geologists there and uh, prospectors. Um, uh, the rest of us are based in the Vancouver area of, of British Columbia in Canada. Um, at this point in time, I think the, 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 the main uh, sort of uh, central office is here, but uh, certainly uh, we're, we're engaging quite a bit uh, with uh, people on the ground in Chile. And, and how much money have you spent to date? Uh, to date, we've spent $4.5 million in, ex in over the, the eight projects, and uh, we weren't able to, to really pare them down or eliminate any of them. They all came back with some interesting results, so we're going to have to spend a significant amount of money. I think we've uh, allocated about $3 million to $3.5 million for um, core drilling uh, in the next year, and starting with the Block 4, which is at uh, approximately 3,500 meters and uh, might, uh, might be done uh, by May or started by May and uh, then going on to, to other locations uh, down the way. So we certainly have a, uh, a lot of drilling to do and it's an exciting time for this company. Very good, thank you very much, James. Next, Gerard Farley with Empire Securities. Um, some of my questions have been answered, but um, what the wa <coughs> water is apparently a big issue there at the moment is that do you finding that as well access well at this to point uh, most of the drilling and exploration um uh water required is trucked in uh, there's there's uh, uh not any problem in that regard but um when it comes to development um that really uh is something to consider and um you know uh, i don't have a, a direct answer to that but I'm, I'm certain that some of the majors in the area which are we're peppered around all of these majors of course in this area because there's such a such a vast amount of land grab going on um you know uh, they're uh, they're obviously going to have answers to, to that question but on the other points of environmental and uh, social there is really no people in this location and and really no trees to speak of, uh, no bushes to speak of. And our final question goes to Daniel Porter, Pure Asset Management. Yeah, thanks Paul, great presentation. Uh, just a quick one, the board holds about 10% of the stock, I believe, are they participating in the latest capital round? Yes, uh, the board is participating in the latest capital round. Um, okay, we can taking up full or... yeah. yeah, our major, our major shareholders as well are participating. 
Do you have a follow-up question, Daniel? No, that's all for me. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, Paul. Again, my apologies for uh, moving on prematurely. Uh, no problem. Thanks. Great, great, Thanks all. great presentation. Great presentation. Our final presenter today is the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of Guanajuato Silver. That is James Anderson, otherwise known as G, G Silver. James, it's all yours. Thank you, Ellis. You're doing a fantastic job. G Silver or Guanajuato Silver, I've got three minutes to convince the judges to spend a million bucks speculating on Guanajuato Silver. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to spend the first part of our, our time talking about the reward aspect of our upcoming drill program. And then, then I'm going to spend the next half of our time talking about why the risk is mitigated as we've put the El Cubo mine, silver and gold mine back into production on time, on track and on budget in 2021. So I'm going to share a few uh, images of our presentation. Just like that there. We're in central Mexico. Mining for silver and gold. You can see the town of Guanajuato, which is uh, what our company is named after. It is a beautiful old colonial town because people have been mining here for 450 years. I was born in Timmins, Ontario, where we're very proud to have been mining for 120 years, but it ain't no 450 years like they do in Guanajuato. I'm going to talk about a, a drill target that we've got along the Veta Madre, the mother vein, which people have been mining here, as I said, for centuries. What you're looking at here is a picture of Valenciana from the 1880s. A hundred years before this picture was taken in the 1780s, Valenciana was producing about 40% of the entire world's silver. So an extraordinary belt, and you can see the mines that go on for kilometers. Where we're going to be starting to drill, um, in, uh, and we have been drilling for some time, but we're going to be doing a, a deeper drill program in just the next 60 days or so um, along the Veta Madre at our Penguico property right here. So Penguico was about 110 years ago listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It was the, the richest mine in the area in this storied uh, silver and gold production area at that time. This, the image that you're looking at right now is from the 1909 annual report of the Penguico Mines Company of New York City. All of the red dots here are, are holes that we drilled last year into this vein system. And you can see some of the results are, are very interesting indeed. Uh, over 900 silver equivalent over narrow widths, but it's deeper than this at the, the intersection of the Penguico system and Veta Madre. That's the target that's very interesting. The first three drill holes that we're going to do is to come right across here and drill into Veta Madre to make sure that that system is in place um, and, and plunging, uh, dipping towards the, the west. We're pretty sure that this is going to exist because Fresnillo mined immediately, I mean, right here, immediately to our east uh, for 30 years between 1972 and 2002. So we'll start that drilling in just the next 60 days or so. That's the upside. That's what, okay. that's what can happen here. I've got to call time. I'm, I'm sorry, James. Understood. Have, thank you very much. Great presentation. I really appreciate it. Let's continue with the judges. John Forwood, Lowell Resource Funds Management. Let's go with your question, please, sir. Oh, thanks, James. Um, you know, Declare, I got a bit of background here. We were on the register um, for a while. Uh, James, great presentation. Um, just a little bit about the current production. What, um, you know, is how are you going in terms of uh, profitability? Um, and uh, do you have any debt um, to, uh, to service as a result of that production? Thanks, John. Yeah, I appreciate your support in the market. Uh, and I, I appreciate the, um, the uh, ability to be able to comment on the lower risk profile of our company, having put this thing back into production last year. Uh, what we have stated so far is that in November and December of last year, we produced uh, a total of about 240,000 silver equivalent ounces. If you mm, scale that up for three months rather than two and scale it up by another 15% or so, that's our production for the first quarter, and we'll be able to comment on that you know, in, in the public in the not too distant future. What I have said all along, John, is that we would be EBITDA positive in the first quarter, uh, even, even if it's um, by just a few pennies, and that has proved to be the case. In terms of debt, I'm sorry, yes, 
about seven and a half million dollars uh, notional value of debt. That's with our friends at OCIM, who are the uh, French and Swiss family office that lent us money last July. And um, we're going to be um, redoing that debt to extend the, the repayments uh, a little bit further into the future with them. And that was announced last week. Very good. Thank you very much, John. Keith, please. Uh, John, uh, John uh, uh, Is it John or James? James, James. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, a great presentation. Uh, quick question. Uh, do you have any issues with, uh, you know, uh, Mexico is, has its uh, safety, personal safety issues, uh, any, any of those in that mine, uh, mine area? Uh, yeah, the... I, I just want to say that, that that's the number one risk. If, 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 you know, a personal safety risk is the number one political risk. Well, I don't know. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, on, on this show so far, we've talked about, um, you know, good jurisdictions. Uh, I, I would um, I would present the idea that there are no good mining jurisdictions left in the world, only some that are less bad than others. Um, I think that Mexico, by virtue of the fact that there's so much mining that takes place there, is better than most. In terms of personal safety, I, no, not at all. I, I, I travel there all the time. Uh, during COVID, I spent months and months in, in Guanajuato um that it is not an issue okay great and I, I i don't know if i missed this uh what's your resource resource in all categories i know you're not really yes. supposed to do that but in all categories it's about 27 million silver equivalent ounces that's from a pea that we did last year that bear dole bear authored okay. very good thank you very much keith great questions as usual yeah. james morrison regress from resource royalties fund please yeah Hi, James. Um, I understand you're producing a concentrate, is that correct? Correct. Um, are, is there any uh, deleterious elements, arsenic and the like at all in your concentrate? There are not. Um, it's an extraordinarily clean concentrate. And um, by virtue of that fact, we had eight different concentrate buyers bid for that material last year. The, the El Cubo material is well known to all the concentrate uh, buyers. We ended up going with Ocean Partners and they have been excellent partners for us. Um, you know, there, there are charges, uh, you know, penalties against arsenic and, and selenium. We never get charged a, a penalty uh, in, in selling them that concentrate. Thank Very you. good. Thank you. Gerard Farley, your question is next, sir. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I haven't, um, this is the first time I've heard of G Silver, but, I, and that's my problem. Um, <laughs> but what's your well, how much uh, cash have you and how much and when will you have you been to the market recently? We raised some money in December uh, right. and um, uh, all of our long term supporters were, were very um, supportive at that time. We have about seven million U.S. dollars in the Treasury currently. And your market cap? About a hundred. I'm uh, going back and forth between Canadian and U.S. It's about a hundred million U.S. dollars. Right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our final question will be from Daniel Porter. Yeah, thanks, James. Very interesting. Um, just talk a little bit about what your positioning on the cost base um, for that silver production. And also, uh, I think um, uh, you were talking about in one of your presentations, uh, producing around uh, or running at a, a processing rate of about 30,000 tonne a month. Is that where you're still at? And where do you expect to be at, um, at steady state? And how is that sort of progressing as well? Yeah, so you know the way, the way that I like to um, to phrase it all the time is ramping up, ramping up, ramping up. We took on this asset from Endeavor, and they obviously didn't leave us with you know all of the highest grade material at El Cubo staring us in the face. Um, in the uh -huh. fall, I was always talking about you know ramping up to twenty two thousand five hundred or twenty five thousand tons a month. We're at thirty thousand tons a month currently, although ten thousand tons a month comes from that El Pinguico stockpile that we have just ten kilometers away. Um, the, the other important aspect of it is that that ramp up continue so and so we're at 30,000 tons a month right now and comfortably there. Uh, the ramp up does continue in terms of grade uh, as we access higher grade areas of, of Kubo and we're getting a little bit better sorting some of the material from the Pinguico stockpile. Thanks. Fantastic and that is our time for questions for our final presenter. Thank you very much, James. Well done. Nice to see you with this company, by the way. 
fantastic. And everybody did such a wonderful job of presenting. I think we've got five strong companies across the board. This is not going to be an easy decision for our judges. And I certainly hope I don't have to break the tie. <laughs> uh, again, let's review the companies that we are going to be potentially awarding a million dollars to. Northern Graphite, Altamira Gold, Kalanix Mines, Pampa Metals, and Guanajuato Silver. And we're going to take the next 10 minutes and go through our judges and get their vote. We will begin with John Forwood. Oh, thanks, Ellis. Look, yeah, great. Um... Great uh, selection of companies there, and really, um, really good to you know for, for sitting here in Australia to have um, you know North American um, or TSX or CSE listed companies um, presenting, and, and a lot of fresh stories for, for me anyway. Um, I'm going to come at this from a, a, a bit of a subjective viewpoint, in that um, we like to um, take a little bit more expiration risk than most, so. Um, you know, we were very happy shareholders uh, with, with Zed Silver, but um, as it moved into production um, and we, we took some profits there. So I think the two companies that really, um, or maybe three companies that are, are sort of really sort of focused on, uh, Pampa Metals perhaps came in third for, for me, very early stage, it sounds like, but a magnificent uh, sounding team. Um, and then look, the second, you know, uh, was, I guess, Kalanex, you know, fantastic, fantastic discovery. Um, the runs on the board uh, and, and, and in a great location to um, um, uh, get that project into production very quickly. But I think, you know, my favourite, just because it does seem to be rich with um, exploration potential and, and, and we do like Brazil, was um, Altamira. Um, some interesting porphyry targets there, which sound like there's a good chance to get them joint ventured and some, you know, exciting trenching and, and drilling coming up on some of the, some of the gold targets. So um, Altamira gets, gets my vote. Great analysis. Thank you very much, John. And congratulations to Altamira for the first vote. Keith Spence, time to make a choice. Sir. Well, yes, a tough choice. Uh, all five presenters were quite good. Uh, some better than others, but they were all great. Um, for number three, uh, I, I would put Northern Graphite. Uh, actually, we're repositioning and in fact, uh, looking at a new fund right now for, for the uh, transition metals space. So I, I kind of like the graphite story. It's a good story, uh, but uh, uh, the presentation it was not my number one presentation uh, tonight. And one of the key criteria here is who had the best presentation as well as uh, who would I like to invest in uh, if I was gonna make that decision. Number two for me, I like uh, my guy in Mexico who doesn't worry about his personal safety risk, but I think that's a story. <laughs> I like the fact that uh, we have something there, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it's it's trying to uh, go the next step, and 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 I'm quite bullish on silver long term. And number one, I, I, in my opinion, I think Max Porterfield was the best presentation. Uh, he covered all the bases, and it's an exciting new discovery. I think he should sell that story more. I'm not sure it's well known that uh, he has a discovery of substance. And uh, overall, I, I, I just like uh, the presentation. I like the project uh, or what he's attempting to do. And uh, copper is king, Copper king copper is back. And that's Keith, my, my list. Great, great present, great analysis. It's always good to chat with you either in person or in this forum. Thank you much for your participation today. Thank you, Alice. Congrats, congratulations to Kalanex. Mr. Morrison, what is your choice, sir? Yeah, when I first started attending mining conferences, I was told they were places where people who pretended to have projects met people who pretended to have money. Um, now, that may be a little unfair, I think, with this case, because I think all these projects look very, very interesting. Um, in terms of my preference, uh, I'll give it uh, three, two, one, as everyone else has done it. I'm uh, very, uh, very interested in, in, in Max's project, the Kalanex project, 
um, and also I love the way they define themselves as explorers uh, and that's that's really their strength and I'm sure they'll find someone to come and develop that project uh, um, and and look I guess for the next project um, I'm, I'm I'm intrigued about the uh, about graphite and 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 the way that Gregory described his project he seemed to have great knowledge and I think offered that sort of uh, realism about this uh, about the the um, the uh, his industry, the costs and the relevance of offtake contracts and the like, and I think we all benefit from that sort of knowledge. Um, because we look at later stage projects and because of the success of getting this G Silver um, uh, project into um, into production, and I'll, and I'll admit I know very little about it, um, but it, you presented very, very well. And I, and, and I think everyone's looking to try and get some exposure to silver and you're in production. So congratulations, I think I, I, I give you my vote. Thank you. Excellent analysis. Thank you very much, James. Really appreciate it. And congratulations so far to you, Mr. Anderson. Next, we'll hear from our friend in Australia, Gerard Farley. Uh, well, I'm, I'm struggling for three, so I'm going to have an equal third uh, because I, I think it's so, un, it's so rare to be able to get a good graphite uh, exposure. But I can't see how the markets, uh, you know, I, I just don't know how I can, uh, I just can't see, I, I can see the price going up a lot. I just don't know how to flow. Um, Mexico, the silver I liked, uh, I'd be happy to visit there next time the rotor. Um, the second is uh, Altamara, Brazil. I'm, I've always been a preferred copper and gold because they seem to, they balance themselves out in any cycle we've been in. Um, and I think it's got a huge potential, but I can't go past uh, the grades at uh, Kalinex. Um, I think it's when you've got those sort of 4% copper and, uh, and whatever, and then the byproducts of silver, zinc, um, and gold, and, and a de jure section that's, um, you know, even though it's seasonal, but I, I think I have to go with Kalinix. Um, but I, I enjoyed almost every company there in the presentation. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Gerard. Great analysis. Everybody is doing a wonderful job of giving the reasons why they're making the choices they've made. So, let us finish up with Daniel Porter, Pure Asset Management. Daniel, we're, we're awaiting anxiously your, your vote. Yeah, thanks, Ellis. And again, reiterate uh, some really good presentations today. So well done to everybody. And uh, some really good looking projects here um, across the board. So I think mean, coming into number three, um, we are big fans of copper at um, Pure and, um, and and quite like the environment around Tilly as well. So um, Pampa Metals gets our vote uh, coming in at number three. Uh, and number two, congratulations to uh, the guys at, 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 at at G Silver and James uh, for getting that back into production. Uh, we like assets uh, a bit like uh, the Gresham guys that are coming into production and, and somewhat de-risk. We're a hybrid debt fund, so um, that suits us. Uh, that suits us. But you know, well done. I think that's going to shape up pretty nicely over the next twelve months or so. Uh, and again, I think um, from our perspective, taking a little bit more risk than we normally would, but with some pretty incredible grades and uh, and a good jurisdiction and, and a great presentation as well, um, Max at uh, Kalanex get their number one vote. Well, <clears throat> it seems, and thank you very much, Daniel. Great analysis. Everyone's been wonderful today from the presenters to the judges. Our winner of $1 million is Kalanex and congratulations to you, Max Porterfield. Excellent presentation. Sounds like you're running a great company. We look forward to hearing from more more about you and what you're doing during the next six months or the next year for that matter, as I look forward to hearing from every single company here, great presenters, every single one of you, fantastic job. I like all the projects. So uh, I'm gonna continue to take a look at them all. My name is Ellis Martin. I have been running a program called the Ellis Martin Report for over 20 years. We're a radio show and podcast sourced around the world through our friends at ABN Newswire in Australia and a variety of venues to an audience of investors globally through a radio show again and a 